Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. I am Justin Burke, joined tonight by Dr. Krista Chu Manchu and our wonderful producer and showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazer. What's up, Sam? Hey, guys. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> excited to have everyone together for this Great Neff Madness episode. Our guest tonight is Dr. A.C. Gomez. She is here to discuss transitions from pediatric to adult nephrology as part of Neff Madness. We use Alport syndrome as a great case. You're going to hear about it. But before we dive into content, hey, Chris... Can you tell us about the show? Of course. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. Before we get into our wonderful guest bio, um, we'd love to take this time to welcome everyone to the Neff Madness Pod Crawl. Woo! So the idea, yeah, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. yes, we'll look at that energy. The idea Jeez. behind a pod crawl Beans. is uh, for a variety of podcasts to coordinate on timing and topic to push the theme and get each other's listeners to explore all of the podcasts. One of the first goals behind Neff Madness was to build a community. In the early years of Twitter, Neff Madness was the central to the formation of, quote, hashtag Neff Twitter and defining the ethos that makes our online community kind, intelligent, vibrant, and interesting. The Neff Madness Pod Crawl hopes to inspire and grow the nephrology podcast community in the same way. So for 2023, our second year, the Pod Crawl has assembled the Avengers of Medical Pods. So this is the Curbsiders, who'll get skinny on the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. Core AM will be covering kidney transplant in the classic five pearl format. Cardio Nerds will be covering the effect of heart failure devices on kidney health. Freely Filter will be trying to understand thrombotic microangiopathy. ISN Global Kidney Care goes deep on IgA nephropathy. We at the Cribsiders look at the transitions, but don't worry, we won't give much away right now. And Fellow on Call will be covering onco-nephrology. Last but certainly not least, the Nephron segment looks at transgender health and CKD. Eight podcasts, one for each region in this year's Neph Madness. So go to nephmadness.com slash podcrawl to get all the links to all the shows. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. A.C. Gomez. She is a MedPeds Nephrology Fellow with a passion for the kidneys, medical education, and Philadelphia sports team. Sorry, A.C. Although from the Philly area originally, she's now living in Boston, spreading the word of how great the kidneys are and working on how we can improve transitions of care for patients with chronic kidney disease. Today, as part of the Neff Madness pod crawl, we use Alport syndrome as an example for CKD1, and boy, does she give us a great primer into CKD. She also talks about how to prevent complications from chronic kidney disease and ultimately how to transition these patients to adult providers. I think everyone's going to really like this episode. I like it. We didn't go with the urine one. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm in. (laughs) You're in for a treat, guys. Yeah. (laughs) Dr. Gomez, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. We're an informal group. We wanted to be formal to start, though, with all due respect. But we're hoping that we can, uh, because we're friends, uh, call you AC throughout the episode. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. You can always call me AC. And if you forget my name in the course of this podcast, don't worry. I also always tell people in the hospital, you can just yell, hey, nephrology, and I'll still answer to it. Uh, That is so reassuring because I always feel very guilty when I see the nephrology team, but I forget the attending's name or someone. And I'm always like, oh, kidneys. And then get their kidneys. Oh, great. While, While I have you. My favorite joke, not to, uh, but this will be this will be at the expense of cardiologists. So I think we can bond over this. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite like bits that I do to amuse myself is we have clowns in the hospital sometimes, and I'll always go up to them and be like, "Hey guys, are you with cardiology? Are you the cardiology team?" <laughs> and both times I've done this, I, I've done this twice. Both times the clowns like totally well intentioned, like, "Oh my god, no, sorry, we're we're like here just to help with children. We're not we're not the cardiology team." And it's like, all right, thanks. Um, I've clowns. Clowns too, but it's an adult hospital, so it's really confusing. I, it's great. I, I love interacting with the clowns. Um, all right. So enough of Justice anecdotes about trying to be funny. AC, we would love to get to know you better. Our audience would love to get to know you better. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Maybe as a one-liner, as like we do uh, patients, or anything that you want to tell us that listeners should know, maybe something outside of medicine. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm a Philly area native. Uh, go birds, devastating lost in the Super Bowl. Mm, but tough. I'm a med peds nephrology fellow, and I have the most irrational love of teaching about the kidneys that you'll ever encounter. 
super passionate about demystifying the black box that most people think of it as. And I love improving transitions of care, especially for teenagers, because teenagers and four years old are my favorite age. And I think they're the same developmentally. Don't don't dispute it. Very um, amazing. <laughs> and when not defending the beans, I love watching reality television or just exploring Boston with my husband, who's a MedPeds pulmonologist and just all around better human than wow. me. Wow. Oh, whoa. Is a MedPeds family uh, <laughs> yeah. in your house and on the, the show tonight. So this is great. AC, can you explain what, what is a MedPeds nephrologist? Do, do you mm. like both or what, what what's up with that? Is that a thing? That's an excellent question. Uh, there are a few of us out there, believe it or not. And so we there's a couple of us who actually have done a MedPeds nephrology fellowship, or I'm doing one right now because it's just cradle to grave beans. Like, why would you not want to take care of all of them? So I'm actually ever- training to do both in fellowship. Do you ever accidentally tell an adult patient to do PD and a PEDS patient do HD? <laughs> Sometimes, but then you just got to run with the mistake. Oh, I see. <laughs> Double down. Yeah, Cradle the Graves Beans might be the title of the show. I think. Uh... <laughs> Actually, yes. Yes. It's like also it. our band name, too. Yeah. All right. So, wait. Sam, do you want to go first? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, since this is our Neff Madness episode, let's ask a couple questions about Neff Madness. So, What's your favorite part about Neff Madness? Okay, my favorite part about Neff Madness are A, everybody getting excited about nephrology for an entire month, and hands down, any year that there is an animal region, because people mm. throw down over that region, and I'm actually devastated that there's not one this year. It's always the most intense debate, like last year when our fellowship group made a bracket, and I love ending teaching sessions with a fun animal fact. So it always is also completely self-serving in that it helps me to do that. I still remember the shark uh, sodium management from like four years ago, making it pretty far in the bracket, but not quite, not quite winning. Devastating. Animal House never so, wins. It's devastating. It's tough. Uh, You're the underdog. Who do you think is going to win this year? If it's if it's not the animals, you can at least take that one out. Okay, so selfishly, I'm rooting for either transitions of care or transgender kidney care because I think that's super important. Realistically, though, if I'm a betting woman, I'm betting on IGA. It's super hot this year. Mm. I think we read different newsletters, but I believe you that IGA is hot <laughs> and I'm fascinated to go home and like read a little bit more about that because uh, I feel like I'm, I'm missing a trend or a fad. But I am in full support of rooting for transitions of care because that is what we're going to talk about in a little bit. But we'll keep doing some questions. Chris, what do you got? All right. So my favorite question is, what is your favorite failure and what did you learn from it? Okay. So this one's a throwback and it has nothing to do with medicine, nor is it my biggest failure in life, but it's probably my favorite. So this takes me back to my high school days, which is longer ago than I'd like to admit. And I just wanted to go to college and study physics. It's all I wanted to do. It was my favorite class. I had the best teacher. Everything was wonderful. I was like a super nerd in high school, did really well. So you'd think like, okay, you know, this is her favorite subject. She does really well in school. She's going to rock this AP test, right? Like we all remember those tests. And so I get to it, test day comes, and I just absolutely bomb this thing. Like I get wrecked. I probably would have done better if I had at least just gotten my name right, Mm. but nothing. And it was this feeling of devastation, like all my dreams went out the window in a single day because it's high school. And that's what you think, or at least that's how I thought. And I think a lot of times that's a pressure that we put on kids or even sometimes ourselves, especially in medicine about one day or one test. So I go to college and I start taking my classes and I'm taking bio classes and physics classes and I'm calling myself a bio major, but the whole time physics is still my favorite. I'm leaving class like, man, did that just blow your mind or what? Like totally nerding out over it. Get a tutor when I need to, put the work in, work with my classmates on the P sets. But it wasn't actually until spring semester of junior year that I kind of got up the nerve to actually change my major and formally call myself what I was, which was basically a physics major despite everything that had happened. And so I think it taught me that in life when you have a setback, that's really all it is. And it doesn't mean that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough that you can't learn it, that you can't do it, and you just have to keep going. And I think about that all the time, especially in nephrology, because so many people say that they can't learn nephrology or other things, that it's not that it's too hard. You can do it, and setbacks are just a totally normal part of the process. And sometimes in just our system, and we ourselves, we don't always do a good job of allowing for the setbacks. And the other thing is that sometimes when you take the pressure off and just let yourself really enjoy it and do it for the love of it, and you get that passion back, that's when you really excel at something. 
Yo, I love that. I think uh, that normalizing that part of the process is one, getting confused about the kidneys because it is quite confusing <laughs> a lot of times. Um, and two, yeah, F A P tests. Um, but uh, also just that like overcoming the adversity, like the challenge is the way, the obstacle is the way. That's like how we grow and thrive. Love it. This episode of the Crypt Saturdays is brought to you by Panacea Financial, a nationwide digital bank built by doctors for doctors. Whether you're a fourth-year med student, a resident, or an attending physician, Panacea Financial is a bank designed specifically for you. Panacea offers free checking with no ATM fees nationwide, 24-7 customer service, and loan options custom-made for physicians or trainees at every career stage. Instead of running up credit card debt, try your PRN personal loan that's designed to give you a better way to cover expenses such as relocation, board exams, home renovations, or even consolidating high-interest debt. Panacea's PRN personal loan is funded in as little as 24 hours, with interest rates starting at half of a typical credit card. They understand money can be tight, which is why they offer a period of no or reduced payments on their PRN personal loans. They also support physicians in other ways, including helping you start, expand, or even buying into a practice or surgery center. If you're ready to join the thousands of doctors who have declared independence from traditional banks, visit panaceafinancial.com today to open your free account. Panacea Financial is a division of Primus member FDIC. So let's dive into some content because we got an yeah. ambitious script that I'm really excited to talk about. And so how about we dive into some content? Sam, you want to start us off? Yeah, absolutely. So we have Al Port. Uh, he's an eight-year-old boy. He's presenting to your clinic with hematuria. He was recently seen in the emergency room for five days of fever, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. He was ultimately diagnosed with viral gastroenteritis. However, his UA was notable for hematuria. So he was told to have it repeated at his PCP's office where the hematuria was still persistent. After asking more questions about his family history, you discover that Al's grandfather and two uncles both developed renal failure in the 50s. You were concerned about hereditary nephritis and obtain a BMP, which reveals a creatinine of 0.35. So first question for you, AC, um, does a normal creatinine exclude the diagnosis of hereditary nephritis or Alport syndrome? So Definitely not. A normal creatinine does not exclude a diagnosis of hereditary nephritis or Alport syndrome. So in general, if there's any concern that a child may have a kidney issue, even if their creatinine is normal, it's the type of thing that we want to know and work up so that they can get appropriate screening and monitoring and so that we can give them some preventative measures as well. Awesome. And we are going to talk about a lot of those things. Um, but before we do that, would you mind just walking us through the pathophysiology of Alport syndrome? Yeah. So from a kidney perspective, so remember, throwback, your kidneys are composed of about a million nephrons each, and each one is composed of a glomerulus and a tubule, each nephron. So your glomerulus has a really important structure called the glomerular basement membrane, which is responsible for filtering the blood and keeping the good stuff like blood and protein in, and then letting it ultrafiltrate through into the Bowman space where things can then be secreted and reabsorbed in the tubules and ultimately form urine. So among other things, your glomerular basement membrane is composed of collagen and specifically type 4 collagen. So in the fetal kidney, you have trimers of collagen 4, alpha 1, and 2. But then in the mature GBM, it's composed of trimers of collagen 4, alpha 3, 4, and 5. So Alport syndrome is a genetic disorder that affects type 4 collagen, and it can take a lot of different forms. So one can be if you don't produce these chains or one of these chains, then the other chains are degraded and your GBM still remains composed of that alpha 112 trimer that the fetal kidney is composed of. But this is thinner, so you can see thin basement membranes on the biopsy, and then later these develop into irregular thin and thickened areas in that classic basket weave pattern. And it can inappropriately let red blood cells through when normally these shouldn't be able to filter through the mature glomerular basement membrane. Or you can have abnormalities where the protein is produced, but it doesn't fold properly or form the trimer properly. And really any of these issues can lead to the spectrum of disease that we consider Alport syndrome. And so if I can maybe just do teach back so that I want, first of all, what a beautiful explanation of the nephron glomerulus and Bowman space to the tubules. I feel like it's a beautiful, I can like reimagine my physiology book, uh, Costanza, that purple, uh, whatever book. Um, but it sounds like the, so Alport really is just the collagen thinning essentially the basement membrane. And so things like blood get through when they shouldn't. Is that for, you know, a simpleton like me, a reasonable <laughs> take home? I think that's a reasonable way to think about it. Absolutely. Beautiful. And we're worried about Alport, both because of his presentation of hematuria and his uh, name, which really 
uh, draws a red flag right from the start of the the case. You can't anchor like that, you know. You got <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great point. It's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, how do a lot of the patients? And we're going to talk about kidney chronic kidney disease a little more broadly. But in, as this kind of as a fun case example, um, for someone that has basement membrane pathology like Alport syndrome, how are they typically presenting clinically? Like, what should we be on the lookout so we make sure we don't miss any any Alport syndrome? Yeah. So back when I was in medical school, which is a phrase I never thought I'd hear myself say, we usually thought of Alport syndrome as an X-linked disorder with females being carriers or occasionally affected due to X inactivation. But now we know that there's an X-linked form of Alport syndrome because the gene for collagen 4A5 is on the X chromosome, but the genes for collagen 4A3 and 4A4, which are the other parts of the trimer, are on chromosome 2. So basically, this means that you can have an autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant Alport syndrome, and it's not always X-linked. If there's a family history of Alport syndrome, some people will consider genetic testing, but others prefer to wait until the individual is older so that they can make their own decision about it. But in individuals with a family history, I definitely recommend screening for hematuria and proteinuria because that's something that we commonly see. So clinically, kids will often present with microscopic hematuria, but they may or may not ever have a UA in childhood, so we may not see this. We may see kids referred after blood has been reported on a UA looking for infection or things like that, but then the hematuria, like in this case, is persistent, so then they ultimately come to see us. Then later, they can develop proteinuria, and some can eventually develop kidney failure, but the timing of symptoms really depends on the severity and the type of mutation. So even within families, patients with the same variant the presentation can be very variable in terms of timing or severity of symptoms. So the other thing is, even though I'm kidney centric, obviously, because it's the best organ, Alport syndrome isn't all about the kidneys. So collagen 4 is important elsewhere in the body too, especially the eyes, like the cornea, the lens, and the retina, and it's present in the ears. So people can get sensory neural hearing loss or a variety of problems in the eye, like vision loss, protrusion of the lens, delayed healing of corneal ulcerations, and other symptoms. And then in rare cases, if you have a deletion in call 4A5 that extends into 4A6, people can actually present with lyomyomas, but it's very uncommon. But most patients with Alport syndrome, the big things to keep in mind are going to be kidney issues like hematuria, proteinuria, and later on potentially kidney failure, eye issues like vision problems, and hearing loss. So you're saying that uh, majority of the time we find incidentally after getting UA. So me as a general pediatrician... If I'm getting a UA on a patient and I'm seeing hematuria, one of the things I should probably do first is maybe get a family history. And that should that should then start start me thinking if I need to worry about something like Alport's. Is that correct? Yeah. So I would always get a family history. And then if you get a UA when they're sick, I would repeat it again when they're coming and they're healthy, like for a well child check or in a few weeks when they're a little bit better to make sure that the hematuria and proteinuria are persistent. Will we ever see any of like the vision or hearing stuff on general screening stuff? Or will it be like if they see uh, the eye doctor just for a regular checkup or they're doing their hearing testing at, uh, at school, is, would that be a pathway that we might see these kids first? That, that could be a pathway that you may see these kids first. And then don't forget, too, for kids with hearing loss, the thing that you may actually end up seeing is developmental delay. So for any kids, obviously, with speech delay, we want to screen for hearing loss as the first step. And that can certainly be a presentation of Alport syndrome. And so I think Alport syndrome, we were kind of using as a great example, one to kind of talk about family history, spanning the lifespan. It's one example of chronic kidney disease. And this is something that I always like doing is like a little clinic teaching of having the resident tell me how to define or diagnose chronic kidney disease. And typically, the answer I get is, GFR less than 60, which is always a great starting point because I think that's what we often think of with chronic kidney disease. So we said that his creatinine is 0.35, which uh, I'm going to do the calculation in my head, but that says that his GFR is probably fine. And so does this patient, does Al have CKD? How do we, how do we define CKD um, in a pediatric population? So my pretest probability that Al has Alport syndrome is pretty high in this case, especially with his family history and with my anchoring on his name. Hmm. But it's important not to anchor. So I would get an ultrasound to help me rule out other causes of hematuria, like stones. 
Still, I think that Alport syndrome is probably the most likely. So although we don't commonly use this terminology, like you're saying, a lot of people consider CKD to be a GFR of less than 60, even with a normal GFR, if there's evidence of structural or functional abnormality, like in the case of Alport syndrome, where your GBM is abnormal, this in and of itself is classified as stage one chronic kidney disease. So this can be important to keep in mind when you're thinking about more formal testing, even prior to disease manifestations, because health insurance protections are currently in place, but a formal diagnosis of CKD, even with a normal GFR, can, depending on the state, affect an individual's ability to obtain disability or life insurance, and this should be balanced basically with each individual against how it may affect their screenings or management, or how it can affect further screenings or testings for family members. So for these reasons, anytime that you're considering making a more formal diagnosis, it's really important that genetic counseling accompany any testing that's being considered. Hmm. And so this is great insight that I typically don't think about with health insurance and so important. CKD, you can have a fully well-functioning, normal creatinine, normal EGFR, but it's those structural abnormalities, whether it's a collagen abnormality or things like horseshoe kidney, is that right? Like any structural abnormality is uh, is automatically a definition of CKD, even if there is normal renal function at the time. Is that, yeah. Is that so right? So those things would be considered stage one CKD. Exactly. And then, so then the stage in your CKD, but then after that would then followed by GFR, is that correct or not? Yeah. So for staging of CKD, basically stage one CKD is a GFR of 90 or more, but when you have an evidence of a structural abnormality. And then stage two is a GFR of 60 to 89. Stage three is a GFR of 30 to 59. And then that's further subdivided into 3A and 3B. Stage four is 15 to 29. And then stage five is less than 15 or on kidney replacement therapy. But the exception to that staging is actually kids under age two because their normal GFR is different and actually lower. So for children under age two, you need to compare their estimated GFR to age appropriate norms. And is that similar to like hypertension or something like that? You say, hey, if it's above this percentile, then you get this diagnosis. And we can link to whatever that table is in the show notes when, we, uh, when we're done here. Yeah, that's actually a good question. So, I mean, all of these are good questions. Sorry, mm-hmm. you, should, you should cut that part. But, but Sam's I, winning. No, uh, no, yeah. no, no, no. We're going to give no, Sam no, no. credit to do. Yes. It is yes, the yes, first yes. good question, guys. <laughs> Finally, we're moving on past what is CKD and getting into the good stuff. Is I wrote all the questions. <laughs> I lose out for all of those ones, too. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, normally for kids under age two, I think what they do is just like, kind of like, I think it's less like a formal staging like it is. And once you're over age two and more just a comparison to what the age appropriate norm would, would be. Have you guys ever drawn the clock thing uh, for EGFR? I feel like this is my, the, my only two, my only value added as a, a clinical educator is I would draw a clock of 12, nine, six, and three, and then add a zero and 12 to 90 is stage one, 90 to 60 is stage two. We'll do a link, but that's how I've always I, taught this. I think I learned that from far. Joel Toff from a curbside episode, didn't he? I don't know. Do I I take I, I remember the resident that taught me that in medical school, and I give her credit, although I forget her name. Well, now that you guys taught me that, I'm going to teach it to my patients, and I'm not going to give any Beautiful. of you guys credit. I'm going to say I came up with that's, it. <laughs> you you can take full credit. Uh, the world would be a better place if people didn't care about who. To credit for that quote. I think Winston Churchill wanted to make sure that he got credit for that quote. I don't know. Who said that. <laughs> it doesn't matter who said that quote. This episode of The Cribsiders is sponsored by Glass Health, a new digital notebook designed for clinicians and learners. With Glass, you can capture all of the schemas, script cases, and pearls you encounter and leverage them to take better care of patients. Their notebook is perfect for organizing all your tutorials, papers, podcasts, photos, slides, whiteboard doodles, whatever you have that's been building up in your email or phone, put them into Glass. Glass also has a community library with fantastic pages from clinicians around the world so you can steal the schemas of people who are much smarter than you and keep learning medicine. The community library is filled with dot phrase like clinical plans for common situations we encounter on the wards and in the clinic. So go try Glass Health for yourself today by visiting glass.health to keep all your medical knowledge in one place. And guess what? The pro version of Glass, it gives you access to AI features so you can be artificially intelligent and all the medical knowledge visualizations. You can get one month of Glass Pro free by signing up at glass.health and using their code word CURBSIDERS. We're part of the CURBSIDERS family. So put in CURBSIDERS. Glass.health. AC, I have one question. So you said 
stage three is broken into three A and three B. Mm-hmm. And I've I've heard like at least for an adults, you know, they say they break it down to in terms of increasing severity of like how close you're going to refer to nephrology. Like, is this hold true with like with peds too, or what? What's the is there a reason why it's broken down three A three B, or is it, is it useful at all? So in peds in general, if they have CKD, I would probably just refer them to nephrology. But where I really think it comes into play is that the kind of the more you progress along, the more you're at risk for certain things that we need to be monitoring for, like mineral and bone disorders or mineral and bone disease. So I tend to think of it as the further along you get on the spectrum, the more I need to start monitoring more closely for those things. So we're going to get into, um, we're definitely going to get into into those as we go on about uh, monitoring and treatment, but let's start in the beginning for treatment. So Al, we are giving him a almost diagnosis of Alport syndrome, but we're getting close there. What medications will we start Al on if that was the case? So I would talk to the family about the possibility of starting an ACE inhibitor if he's formally diagnosed. I think if a diagnosis of Alport syndrome is confirmed, some physicians would actually consider starting an ACE inhibitor at the time of diagnosis now, as long as the kid is older than age two, even before the development of proteinuria or a reduced GFR. But this is an area of debate in the field, to be sure. So where this comes from is that ACE inhibitors in patients with Alport syndrome have been shown to delay the median age of kidney failure in those with proteinuria. And in those with just hematuria, like our patient, or with microalbuminuria, there was a trial that was published in 2020 that was underpowered, but showed a trend toward delayed progression of albuminuria. And it didn't show any increased adverse events as a result of ACE inhibitors in that population. So for that reason, there's some people that will start it at the time of diagnosis now. So that's certainly something that I would talk to the parents about. And do you know if this is a certain dose that you have to like titrate up on, or as long as you're starting a ACE inhibitor, and as long as their blood pressure is okay, um, are you getting that benefit for it? So it's a little bit difficult because when they have proteinuria, then we'll titrate their dose of the ACE inhibitor basically until we kind of have their proteinuria under control. But in that case, I would probably just start it and kind of keep it at that dose. And is ramipril typically the ACE of choice, or will we see other types of ACE inhibitors often used by a pediatric nephrologist? You'll see other types of ACE inhibitors, and it's partially going to depend on what the kid is able to take in terms of what comes in like a liquid form or a pill form, how frequently they need to take it, and what we can get insurance approval for. And I think for most patients that we run into for Alport syndrome, I think as a teach back moment for us, we can probably say hey, titrate up this ACE inhibitor as far as their blood pressure tolerates until the proteinuria gets better. I think that's a, it sounds like a very reasonable thing for us to do. I mean, if we were doing this and we weren't pediatric nephrologists. Yes, that is definitely what I would do. AC, for a patient with Alport syndrome or again, you know, let's say that any they have any known chronic kidney disease. And so that can even, you know, we can start naming some other ones, although I feel that now I'm like very self-conscious and name some well, totally there's no chronic kidney disease. But, you know, if they have minimal change disease, if they have, you know, some other identified pathology where they have some proteinuria or hematuria or something where we want to to monitor them. And let's say that at Cashlack Hospital, our hospital, we have had this long feud with the nephrologist that is, it's, you know, like a, it's a West Side Story situation. And so we <laughs> want to try to get the kid wrapped up as much as we can before we ask for help. What labs are we looking at? Is it just creatinine? Are there other... CKD labs, can you comment on my favorite lab? Because I have no idea if there's actually great evidence for it. Uh, is cystatin C ready for prime time in kids? What, what's, the, what's the lab workup we're doing for kids that we've decided have chronic kidney disease? So it is completely dependent on the stage of CKD, but I'm hoping that maybe we can end the feud. So for patients with Alport syndrome or patients that have just hematuria alone, usually I'd recommend at least a yearly serum creatinine and then screening for proteinuria with a urine albumin to creatinine ratio. If they have proteinuria or albuminuria, then I'd recommend these same tests to be done every six months. Um, And then they should have at least yearly blood pressure checks to make sure that they don't develop hypertension or that we're treating it adequately if they do. 
Then if or when they develop stage three CKD or later stages, in addition to those things, then I would get a BMP so we can get a sense if there's any issues with like hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, or things like that that need to be addressed, getting a phosphorus, calcium, PTH to assess their bone health, and if there's any need for medical management of mineral and bone disease, and then getting a CBC and iron studies to look for possible iron deficiency anemia. And then if the patient has Alport syndrome, remember you should be getting routine hearing tests at regular intervals in childhood, in addition to the routine vision screening that we do in pediatrics. Cystatin C, you can get it. I think a lot of people have difficulty interpreting it, which is the one kind of tricky thing. So I will sometimes get them to see if the estimation of the GFR based on the cystatin C and the creatinine match up, especially if the creatinine is something that I'm really not expecting. The one thing I would be careful of is in inpatients, it can sometimes be helpful, but it can be falsely elevated in patients with inflammation. And so, and certainly since it's newer, we just may not know some of the other limitations yet, but we do know that that's one of them. So a lot of times if the cystatin C, GFR, and the creatinine one don't match up as well, I'll say maybe it's somewhere in the middle, or we may kind of consider more formal testing. So it's something that you can get. It's just, we need to be a little bit careful about the interpretation sometimes. Quick follow-up, my understanding of one of the possible value added in the future is that the creatinine is so heavily based on things like muscle mass. And for especially kiddos or around this kind of children that have severe cerebral palsy or other muscle atrophying, this can actually be something that does help monitor. Are there specific patient populations where this is more helpful um, in estimating an EGFR? Yeah. So I do think that those populations, it tends to be really helpful when you're kind of thinking about exactly like you're saying, people where the creatinine may not be as helpful because it may be kind of an overestimation of their GFR. So I do think in those populations, it's useful, right? So like, you know, in me, because I'm nice and bulked up over here, you can't see it on the podcast, but trust me, guys, for those of you not watching, I'm totally jacked. So for me, (laughs) so for me, the creatinine is very useful. Okay. But for some other people, like, I don't know, maybe your average nephrologist, (laughs) it may not be as beneficial. So I have one question about the uh, screening for protein and uh, proteinuria and and albuminuria. Are we settling on mostly just doing the spot uh, albumin creatinine or protein creatinine? Do we ever do 24 hour like protein? Do we do feel safe that it's pretty accurate using those ratios? I usually will do the spot unless they have something like a severe AKI where I think it may not be as useful, but I typically will do the spot albumin to creatinine ratio. Yeah. When when is biopsy indicated? I I always want to know, like when we, like, I I don't know, maybe we talked about it and I missed it, but I always feel that, you know, let's dive in. Yeah. So, you know, maybe they have some hematuria and then I'm like, Oh, I don't know what to do. And then like, maybe we need a biopsy and the nephrology is like, no, we don't need to. And or sometimes like, I think we need a biopsy and nephrology is like, we need a biopsy. So like, I never know. I I feel like I'm always wrong. So, (laughs) so that's, that's fair. And there is definitely some variation depending on which nephrologist you ask. So that's pretty common. Especially if it's hematuria alone, if we're fairly convinced that it's either not coming from the glomerulus or not a GN, or we look under the microscope and the red cells look nice and euvolemic, or it's not persistent or things like that, then we may consider kind of leaving it alone if they don't have any proteinuria, if their kidney function is fine. But the kids where I consider it are patients that have proteinuria, patients that have reduced kidney function, or sometimes with discussions with the family, if they have recurrent gross, you know, tea or Coca-Cola colored urine, gross hematuria in that way. And I look under the the scope and it looks like it's coming from the glomerulus. Then I'll talk to them about the risks and benefits of biopsy. And so just to quickly clarify, there's other things obviously that can cause hematuria. We talked about kidney stones and looking at ultrasound, but other things I think of like IgA nephropathy. I'm going to run out of the nephrology differential very quickly, but those you're saying it really like looking at a spinned urine or looking at the microscope is really one of the first steps of differentiating these uh, 
types of microhematuria. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So I look at everybody's urine under the microscope. And for kids, I also look at their parents' urine to see if they have undiagnosed hematuria that we don't know about, because that can be helpful as well. Sometimes the parents just may never have had a UA, but you'll actually get that information. So in our clinic, we always spin the parents' urine as well. Um, but yes, exactly. So those types of things, we may be able to tell if the red cells are eumorphic appearing. I think my favorite thing if I was a pediatric nephrologist is walking into a room and be like, we're getting pee from everyone in the room, guys. Cups all around. We're getting, we're getting everyone's pee. That's Here amazing. we go. Hand them out. Hand them I out. have never thought about that. That's such a great idea. Yeah. So if, uh, if, if, if the parents have, have uh, undiagnosed, you just see them in your adult side of the clinic, right? That's actually exactly what I do. So that's why I exist. So I just tell them to walk across the street and then I walk across the street slightly faster using a bridge and just see them over there. That piece is amazing. <laughs> it's, the best, it's the best specialty and everybody listening should go into med peds. I guess I'll, I'll bring us back a little bit. To this, <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> to, to these tests here. So um, so we did talk about getting, as Chris said, a protein creatinine ratio and uh, and this being albumin, which should work for us getting a spot. Um, you had mentioned getting this roughly every six months-ish for someone who's at albuminuria. What about the other test? How frequently should we be getting these tests? Um, you know, and... It seems like nephrologists want them relatively frequently, and if they're in the ED with us, we should, oh, we should get these tests for them, or should we get them in primary care? You know, how often should we be following this stuff? That's an excellent question. So like you said, if they have just hematuria alone, then I'll usually do yearly for hematuria, proteinuria, creatinine. If they have proteinuria, I usually recommend following every six months like we talked about. But sometimes I'll do more frequently if we're doing something like starting an ACE inhibitor to try and optimally control their proteinuria. And then as far as those other CKD labs... The monitoring frequency completely depends on the stage. So for stage three CKD, I'll usually do roughly every six months. For stage four, every three to four months. And then for stage five, every one to three months. And then how frequently in that range that I'll monitor kind of depends on the rate of progression of kidney disease, where in that stage they fall, and then any previous abnormalities. Am I already treating them and I'm monitoring for those things? So it really depends on all of those. So these are great, uh, obviously, things that we're monitoring for. You mentioned um, looking at things like um, the BMP and with progression of disease, there's concern for more uh, bone disease. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why are these children at high risk for, for growth failure? Um, you know, what's putting them at risk for, for bone disease? Why, why are these things that, that occur in chronic kidney disease? So the growth failure in chronic kidney disease, like almost everything in medicine, is multifactorial. So one of the most important things is kids with advanced chronic kidney disease have a relative resistance to growth hormones, so they may actually require supplementation to reach their growth potential. And then they may have additional contributing factors like nutrition issues, mineral and bone disease, and then metabolic acidosis can contribute if it's untreated. Oh, interesting. The dietary? Uh, <laughs> what, tell me more about that. What, yeah. yeah. What's up with that? Yeah. So, so what dietary modifications are needed depends on the nature of the kidney disease and the stage of the kidney disease. But because undernutrition can play a role in growth failure in kidney disease, especially for patients like this, I usually recommend the same healthy, varied diet that I'd recommend for everyone, unless they're having specific issues that would require things like limitation of potassium, phosphorus, etc., but unlike a lot of our adult patients and kids, we try and focus on how to moderate things in a healthy way rather than complete elimination from the diet. Great. And as far as the whole protein, I feel like protein modification in chronic kidney disease diet was something that previously people talked about. Any modification of protein, high protein, low protein in a chronic kidney disease kid? I don't usually recommend protein modifications. I actually don't know the latest guidelines on that, but I typically don't. Great. Wait, so so going back, you're you're saying something about limiting phosphate and stuff like that. So, like there are other ways to look at phosphate too. Like we we, we can do like phosphate binders. There are potassium binders, and then you know in supplementation you can do like vitamin D. Can you can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. So anytime I talk to patients or their families with kidney disease, I tell them that the kidney has a couple major functions, and I realize this is an oversimplification, but the major functions that I tell them to look at are usually. Can your kidney generate enough urine to handle the volume that you're consuming? Because then if not, we may need to do a fluid restriction, um, medicines, or in extreme cases, dialysis to augment this. 
And then can your kidneys regulate your electrolytes? So in particular, can they keep your potassium in a safe range? So if not, we may need to limit the potassium in the diet or use a potassium binder to help bring things down into a safe range. So typically we'll do dietary modification first. And then if your potassium still isn't well controlled after dietary modification, then we'll consider the addition of a potassium binder. Can your kidney buffer the acid that you're generating every day? So all of us generate acid just from existing, and then the kidneys buffer it. So if not, it can cause a chronic metabolic acidosis, and we may need to give bicarb supplementation. Can your kidney generate enough erythropoietin to keep your blood count up, and specifically your hemoglobin? So erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys and acts on bone marrow to produce more red blood cells in response to anemia. So if your hemoglobin's low, then we need to check some iron studies and a reticulocyte count to see if you may need either oral or IV iron, or if we need to, to give supplemental erythropoietin to help bring your hemoglobin up to try and reduce transfusions. And then last is your bone health. So people with kidney disease often have abnormalities in the regulation of their bone health, so specifically calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and PTH. So we check those labs regularly like we talked about. And if your phosphorus gets too high, then we may limit the phosphorus in the diet, which again is typically our first go-to. And then if it's still too elevated, then we may give phosph binders. And if your vitamin D is too low, we may need to give supplements to help optimize your bone health long-term. So that's an awesome breakdown of each of the individual pieces that the kidney runs. Potassium, phosphate, vitamin D, that's awesome. I'm just going to ask, you know, for... Me as a general practitioner, um, I just like to ask a lot of specific questions about how I can do stuff, um, so just so I don't mess it up. And so I might ask a couple questions about each of these individual things. So, for you know, let's start with um, with the potassium. You know, you mentioned if our potassium isn't limited, to use a potassium binder. What number of potassium do we generally say in pediatrics? That's like, ooh, this isn't that good because I know kids can handle higher potassium than adults. Yeah. So in babies, you can kind of let it ride pretty high, but usually once they get a little bit older, I'll typically say above 5.5 is when I'll start to consider first limiting their potassium in their diet and then potentially doing a, a potassium binder after that. I'm glad I asked because I feel like 5.5 for an adult just starting a potassium restricted diet, they've been like, whoa, you know. <laughs> And what about for phosphorus as well? Because I know phosphorus binders are like, you you know, you do them three times a day with meals. When would you generally start those? So phosphorus binders are much trickier. And the reason is because kids are still mineralizing their bones. So we'll actually tolerate pretty high phosphorus for kids. So if they're above 13 or if they're an adult, then again, even though the upper limit of normal is 4.5, typically I'll start a FOS binder when it gets consistently above 5.5 and it's not controlled with dietary modifications. But for kids under 13, you should actually look at the Kadoki guidelines for what a normal upper limit of phosphorus is because that's completely age dependent. And we want to make sure that we don't bring it down too much for those kids since they are still mineralizing their bones. Awesome. That's that's super, super helpful. And then the same thing, um, you know, just because just to round it out here, when we talk about their anemia as well, is there a certain point also when you're going to start EPO? Is there a certain point when you're going to start um, iron supplementation? Did you say, hey, this anemia isn't going to cut it for this kid, even though, again, it's much better than the adult? Yeah, controversial topic. EPO is a very controversial topic. Iron is less controversial. <laughs> so typically yeah, in skip C... Skip EPO then. Skip EPO. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> no, we like controversy. Sam, thanks, Bob, man. <laughs> Let's get it. We get into controversy. So typically for... Anyone with CKD, we want their iron saturation to be above 30% as long as their ferritin isn't too elevated. And then we'll give either PO or IV iron. And IV iron usually tends to be a little bit better, actually, in people with kidney disease. And then if you manage to attain that and their blood counts are still low, some people will aim for a hemoglobin of like roughly 10. But again, that's very controversial. There's not as much data behind that. So how much you'll find people either caring or abiding by that is totally dependent on the nephrologist. No, that makes sense. And I think that's that's fair across the board. Sorry, Justin, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to, I remember being, it's, I'm a little rusty, so I'd like to refresh because I remember this was a teaching point of, uh, that I used to do on chronic kidney disease and bone mineral disease. And just to kind of review the pathophysiology, because it's always fascinating, with poor kidney function, is it the decrease of like activating your vitamin D, which stops calcium absorption, which then increases parathyroid, which then increases bone resorption is that is that right like the how does it how do kidneys hurt bone 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, that's a that's a it's a pretty complicated pathway, but that is right. So um, in your kidney, your vitamin D gets converted from twenty five vitamin D to one twenty five vitamin D, and your kidneys are responsible for helping to reabsorb calcium and phosphorus. And so when you have chronic kidney disease, your phosphorus can get too high. You can have issues with your calcium. Your PTH starts to ramp up exactly like you're saying. And then PTH basically helps your kidneys to excrete more phosphorus and increase your calcium reabsorption, also increase calcium reabsorption in your gut, but it also increases bone reabsorption. And so we want to be really careful to kind of keep those things in a regulated range so that you don't end up with too many long-term issues with your, with your bone health. And then usually we do follow PTH as being the main driver of this, right? And so when are you giving vitamin D for patients based on their PTH? Like what PTH number you say, "Uh uh-oh, I need to treat this and how do you do it? Yeah. So usually for elevated PTH, the first thing that we want to do before we do anything else is make sure that we get the phosphorus into a good range. So you want to control their phosphorus first and see if that helps to control their PTH. If they're vitamin D deficient and they don't already have issues with hypercalcemia, then you can give vitamin D supplementation. And then after that, depending on their calcium level, you can either give calcimimetics or calcitriol to try and bring their PTH down. But this is also another controversial topic in kidney medicine. So here for the actual PTH range that you want, Kdoki typically recommends a PTH range of 150 to 300, and that's going to depend on the stage of CKD. KDGO recommends two to nine times the upper limit of normal, which actually goes all the way up to 600. So you can see that it's not necessarily consistent across guidelines. And again, you'll see some practice variation among nephrologists. This nephrology awesome. controversy makes it sound like the, I bet your national conferences are wild. They're just, absolutely uh, wild. It's just a throwdown every, <laughs> every time. <laughs> Everyone's sitting in different groups. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have your like people that hydrate, people that trust their kidneys, <laughs> people that control the PTH, people yeah. that are just going wild with EPO. Amazing. We're 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 nuts. Um I love and to, it. And and to finish this off, are there um any other medicines that we should be thinking about for um for patients with CKD? You know, we talked about binders, we talked about supplementation, we talked about actually ACE inhibitors as well. Are there any other medicines that we should know of or be thinking of right now? Yeah, so it's always important to control your blood pressure, so that's number 1. And then the other thing is in adult medicine, SGLT2 inhibitors, as you guys know, are mm. all the rage, especially for patients with proteinuric kidney disease. They're starting to be expanded potentially to patients with non-proteinuric kidney disease. But it's important to know that even though some of these trials didn't exclude patients with things like Alport syndrome, only a small number had some of these things. So where we need more data is people with genetic causes of kidney disease and then more data in PEDS because their use isn't currently approved in children. Amazing. And while we're talking about medicines, I feel like no nephrology note is not complete without a list of medications to avoid. And sets. And specifically <laughs> NSAIDs. Can, who can have NSAIDs? Who can't? Are there other medicines that uh, people with chronic kidney disease need to be on the lookout for? Yeah. So I usually will tell people to avoid ibuprofen or other NSAIDs. So for a kid like this who has normal kidney function, I'll be a little bit less strict about it. I may just tell them to reach for the acetaminophen first if they have pain that they need to control and avoid taking NSAIDs regularly. But I'll tell them that it may be okay intermittently, but the worse their kidney function, the more strictly I tell them that they need to try and avoid it. Other medicines, it's really just dependent. So I always joke that in the hospital, every medicine is just an assault on the kidneys. It's just a constant affront to our organ. But <laughs> it really, it really, when you have CKD, I think the most important thing other than avoiding NSAIDs is to make sure that things are renally dosed. And if you're not sure what the dosing should be, then I would recommend either reaching out to your hopefully friendly neighborhood nephrologist or to your pharmacist. I feel like the most common meds in pediatrics. I'm just going to list them off, right? This is all about right. 75% of Rapid all kids. fire. Let's Here do it. it. Yes or no? We already, we, we already talked about acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, I say, is okay. And I usually tell them to reach for that first over the ibuprofen. Nice. Diphenhydramine. 
I do not counsel them to avoid this if they have CKD. So I tell them that it's okay just to make sure that you're kind of starting at a low dose, see how the kid tolerates it. And then especially for school age kids, if they should be taking something else, like if it's just for seasonal allergies to try and reach for something non-drowsy and non-sedating because they need to be on point for school. But otherwise, I don't tell them that they shouldn't be taking it just for the reason of the kidneys. Nice. Everyone's favorite antibiotic in pediatrics, amoxicillin. Clindamycin has been replaced. All right. So amoxicillin, I also don't strictly avoid. We used to hand it out like candy. Don't deny it. But penicillins can cause an interstitial nephritis. So if you start someone on amoxicillin or any penicillin and their creatinine starts to worsen, then that's something to keep in mind. And lastly, our favorite respiratory distress medicine, uh, dexamethasone. Go ahead and do it. I'm on board. IV contrast. (laughs) (laughs) we are the champs all right you're gonna get me in trouble we can skip it we can skip it i say go ahead and give it i think if you need the iv contrast for the study that's that's the most important thing and the risk of contrast i'm in the camp of people that believe that the risk of contrast is overblown so give it if you need to get the study and if you don't you shouldn't give anything that you don't need to give just really right so so contrast induced nephropathy does it exist (laughs) i think if it exists I think it probably exists to some extent, but the the amount of AKI that's attributed to contrast is way more than what actually exists. And so a lot of these questions I think about medications and IV contrast and things we're doing are obviously trying to prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease. And because children have more time on this earth, there's a larger area under the curve where I think we can harm their harm their beans. And so one of the big questions about, you know, this episode is really on the transitions to care. And so I think we've really talked about how as a pediatrician to be thinking about their adulthood and try to prevent progression. But let's say that we now have Al as an 18 year old who's followed by the pediatric nephrologist. He's still taking um, an ACE inhibitor to decrease progression. He's going to transition to an adult provider soon. Can you talk a little bit about this connection between pediatric CKD and adult ESRD? Is there a relationship between pediatric chronic kidney disease and progression or adult end-stage kidney disease? Yeah. So kids with CKD are at a much higher risk for end-stage kidney disease as an adult. So compared to people without childhood CKD, the hazard ratio for the development of end-stage kidney disease is 4.19 in adults. And then it's also associated with a younger age of onset of end-stage kidney disease in adulthood. And there's a study that I remember that I always was fascinated by that – I forget if it was a different study, but it looking at like Israeli soldiers, I think, or something. But uh, kids that had pyelonephritis, any relationship to pyelonephritis and adult in-stage renal disease? Yeah, I am also fascinated by this study. So in fact, there is. So it actually showed a similar link among those with childhood pyelonephritis to adult – and stage kidney disease. I think that may be partially reflective of the cohort of patients who develop pylos. Like they may have an abnormality like reflux or an anatomic abnormality that can dispose them to predispose them to pylo and to CKD. But that relationship does still exist. That was one of my few teaching points whenever we had a, a kid on service that had pyelonephritis was like, this kid's more likely to have dialysis than the one in room 18. Yeah. Justin, you keep saying that you uh, just had this one of my few teaching points. You're racking up the teaching points. I know. Yeah, well, the, the, this is all I got. Uh, this is, I'm trying to get it all right here. There's, uh, yeah. Yeah. there's... And whoever's listening to this episode, this is Justin Burke on wards. Yeah, this is on the wards. You're, uh, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah, nothing else. You've done it. You've jokes. listened to this episode. You're, uh, you're good. So we talked about transitioning from pediatrics to adults. You know, we all recognize for these patients, including Al, that he should be probably followed by a nephrologist for the rest of his life. But the unfortunate thing is sometimes these kids fall through the cracks. So how often do we see this happen? Um, Let's start with that, and then we can talk about things we can do about it. We definitely see it happen really frequently. So I don't have an exact number for you, and it really depends on a lot of different factors. Especially with the pandemic, though, I think it's been a worsening problem that we all face. And it's a really good time to address transitions of care when it's on all of our minds, because follow up has been a huge, huge problem with the pandemic. So what do you think some of the uh, the barriers are to transitioning? There is a lot of barriers to transitioning, and I don't think I'd be able to list them all. But a couple of them are a lot of kids with CKD are seen in large pediatric academic centers, just because that's where the few, the mighty pediatric 
and nephrologists mm-hmm. are concentrated. So while some of them may continue to be seen either in the same system or a neighboring hospital, others are going to disperse and be seen by a variety of community nephrologists who, although they're excellent, transitions of care are definitely harder anytime communication falters. And it's just by nature harder to communicate with a wider variety of people as opposed to when you transition them to one person or one center. There can be different comfort levels with caring for patients who have pediatric diseases. And often our patients in pediatrics don't just have one issue and they may need a lot of different specialists in that care to be coordinated. And coordinating all of these transitions together and in an effective way is really difficult. But otherwise, we end up in a situation where they may not know which hospital to go to if they get sick or they go to one or the other, but only some specialists or some people that know them are there. And so it's really difficult for them to know even where to go for care. Changes in insurance coverage can complicate things. They can have people can have trust issues because they may have a longstanding relationship with their pediatric nephrologist or pediatrician. And then in pediatric centers, there tend to be fewer patients and more resources to help patients and families make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. But in non-pediatric centers, that's usually just not feasible because of a combination of caseload and resources. And then lastly, this is just also a time where there's a lot of other transitions that are going on in their life besides just the things that are going on in medicine. So they may be moving out of state, going to college, moving out of the house, or for other kids, they may be in the midst of the families may be in the midst of addressing things like guardianship issues. So really, there's a whole spectrum. But for pretty much everyone, it's a big period of transition just otherwise in their lives, too. And so can I ask, if I'm primary care physician for a patient with pediatric chronic kidney disease who has this great relationship with their pediatric nephrologist, we're transitioning them. As an adult nephrologist, what are the most important things to know? I presume it's, you know, diagnosis, maybe biopsy results, trend in creatinines. Are there other things that we can do to try to set up the patient's first visit with their adult nephrologist for success, assuming that their pediatric nephrologist is out of the pit. They got hit by a bus. We got to take over the transition. <laughs> um, what, what does the adult nephrologist need to know? I think you just literally decimated the population of pediatric <laughs> nephrologists by hitting one of them with the bus. But, but if that happens, I think definitely, definitely – like you said, diagnosis and kind of their creatinine and their trend. And if they have a biopsy, so is their diagnosis biopsy proven or not? The other thing I want to know is what medicines are they currently on? And then what medicines have they tried in the past, right? So if you have something like, let's say, a nephrotic syndrome, I want to know, have you tried steroids? Is their diagnosis steroid dependent, steroid resistant, steroid sensitive? What immunosuppression have you tried in the past? And then if there's any kind of particular things that I need to be cautious of with that patient or aware of with that patient to think about. So like, oh, it seems like this patient is steroid resistant, but actually we know that when they go on school field trips or things like that, they don't want to bring their prednisone. And so they're actually incredibly responsive or they have difficulty getting to appointments or you know, whatever other things that you just may need to know in general to help take optimal care of them. But especially, like you said, their diagnosis and then past treatments that we've tried and what's worked for them. Very helpful. Great, great question. (laughs) Did you just a great question yourself? That's right. (laughs) That brought up a lot of great information that I didn't, I wouldn't have otherwise known. That was just great. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of myself. I'm going to start doing that when I when I ask people questions in the hospital. I'm going to give them with patients. I'll, you know, they'll yeah. give me something I don't know. And I'll say, man, I just asked a really good question. That's It's a great compliment to, to the person it. answering the question. It's like, that was a great. I'm glad I asked you that question. If you, if you had just said it depends, it'd be like, that wasn't a great question. Was, um, right, what's next? I was just say, you know, in talking about transitions and talking about, you know, how can we best care for people on the across the lifespan. In general, one of the big things that we talk about on this show is really trying to have a commitment to health equity and identifying, acknowledging um, health disparities that exist in really every episode. And I uh, I don't know the details, but I imagine chronic kidney disease, like any other pathology, is one that is very much influenced and affected by health disparities. Is there any information that uh, you have a sense of like, is this something that is present in chronic kidney disease, racial disparities, socioeconomic disparities, or general health disparities? Absolutely. So unfortunately, racial disparities are something that our field has really had to grapple with, especially in the last few years, because a lot of us were taught in medical school 
that black patients may have an increased risk of hypertension or CKD. And a lot of people were kind of given a reason as to why. And a lot of times that reason was kind of blamed on the patients, right? Like lifestyle and things like that. Turns out that's actually not true. And a lot of people have things like high risk APOL1 alleles or things that may predispose them to chronic kidney disease that we didn't really think about before and that went underdiagnosed for a long time which is really a huge shame and a huge disservice that we've done to the community. I think definitely health disparities in any field contribute to adverse outcomes in medicine. So it's something that we always need to be cognizant of and really think about. And then transitions in and of themselves are no exception. So you can have people that are underinsured, uninsured, have difficulty finding a physician. There may not be a nephrologist nearby because we're still sometimes few and far between They may not have adequate or affordable transportation. They may have a harder time finding employment. could be harder to take time off of work to go to appointments. We can have issues with language barriers, trust issues. Education can factor in. There's so many health disparities that contribute to failure to transition and that contribute to adverse outcomes and chronic kidney disease for sure. And it's something that we as a field really, really need to work to address. I feel like even just that, like you mentioned, the EGFR calculation, especially in adults, that's gotten so much press lately about how the the race variable is inherently kind of a racist part of the calculation. And so I think New England Journal of Medicine very recently did a series on this of of removing the race-based calculations, including the EGFR. Yeah. And it's something where we're actually trying to kind of get patients retroactively time on the transplant list if they Mm, were inappropriately not listed because of that race-based calculation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's fascinating. We've talked a lot about these barriers right now. Hopefully we have a little bit of good news. Um, So what can we do to actually try to improve the transitions between pediatric and adult care? Are there any tools that we can use, anything that you'd recommend? Yes. So transitions can be done successfully, I promise. And one thing that I love and I hope all my other MedBeats homies also love is gottransition.org, which is like the best site if you don't know about it. So they have resources on transitioning to a different clinician, transitioning to adult care while keeping the same clinician, the six core elements of transition, how to implement it at your institution, quality improvement resources. They have everything, absolutely everything. And the other thing that's important to remember is that transition process starts well before most people think that it should. So it doesn't start at 18. And a lot of people think it should probably start around age 12 to 14 when we start introducing patients and families to the idea and process of transitioning. So if you have a local MedPeds person, I would recommend reaching out to them to see if they have any recommendations for how to establish and improve the transition process. And then don't forget to engage your colleagues on the other side. So if you're adult medicine engaging pediatrics, and if you're in pediatrics engaging adult medicine, to see what could be improved, what's going well and what isn't going well. And then at the end of the day, the time of transitions is a time when people have a really high risk of relapse or graft loss if they have a transplant and all sorts of different health problems. So really starting the process early and working to improve it at your institution is in the best interest of our patients and families. And it's something we should all be working to improve because you don't want to put in all this good work when you're in pediatrics and then just throw it away at 18. You can't do that, right? So you got to continue it and really help them to be successful for their adult life. Beautiful. A great resource. And again, this has been really helpful. And I think going from cradle to grave with the bean, as far as talking about how to care for them as a pediatrician, how to transition them um, into uh, adult care and these resources to kind of help with the transition You know, we've talked a lot about different topics on this, but, you know, bringing it all together, what are your main take-home points for our listeners? What do you think are the big messages for listeners that, whether trainings or or attendings or advanced practitioners to to know that uh, this episode can kind of help them take care of patients? Yeah. So when it comes to kidney disease and things like Alport syndrome, I think we're starting to see a move towards ACE inhibitors, potentially even before the development of proteinuric kidney disease to slow the progression, but it's still up for debate right now. For all chronic kidney disease, I'd recommend keeping your eye on the latest studies on SGLT2 inhibitors because these are rapidly, rapidly evolving. And then for any specialty, for any pediatric patient, start thinking about transitions early and how, what you can do to help advocate and improve the transition process at your local hospital or institution. So if you have no idea where to start, 
or if you're an expert on transition, scotttransition.org is an amazing resource to think about how to plan and improve this process. And then just like anything else in medicine, implement it, study it, improve it, because this is a really high risk time for patients and families. And after all we've done to help them through childhood, we really owe it to them to set them up for success. And maybe to end, anything that you'd like to plug, anything um, that we can send our listeners to or, or recommend for our listeners to, to learn more? Yes. So in case I haven't plugged it enough, gottransition.org. Everybody go look at it, okay, <laughs> because it's the best. And then the other thing that I'd like to plug for everyone who wants to learn more about nephrology, which should be everyone, I hope, is there's a new book out called The Handbook of Glomerular Nephritis. It's by Patrick Nachman, Michelle Rowe, and Edgar Lerma. And so for everyone, so whether you're a nephrologist or non-nephrologist, it's super easy to read. It's great to look up. They link to visual abstracts. So it's incredible. So when they talk about the data behind things in the ebook, you can link to the visual abstract for the study, okay, in case you don't like to read the whole paper. I, <laughs> it's really helpful. It's really, really outstanding. And then for any medical students, please, 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 please consider med peds. It's a really important specialty. It's super unique. And all patients and populations can benefit from improved transition. So be a part of the movement. Come join us. We love MedPeds people. Love the MedPeds plug. Love, love the handbook recommendation. Handbook of Lamellar Nephritis. I, uh, you know, I, I've heard there's great character development. There's a, a climax in the middle. A great denouement. Uh, very well. It's a must uh, read. Uh, it's great. Yeah, must read. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have it at my bedside. This is great. Awesome. This has been wonderful. You know, I think uh, for a Neff Madness episode, I'm excited. I think I think this podcast itself is going to carry the region or the team. Or I'm honestly not 100 percent sure what we're we're fighting for on this, <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to really help the Blue Ribbon Panel support MedPeds, if nothing else, and GotTransition.org. I think GotTransition.org is going to make it to the semifinals of Neff Madness. It's going to be its own its own region next year. Exactly. We're going to make yep. it happen. Yeah, shark kidneys versus gottransition.org. <laughs> AC, Dr. Gomez, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a wonderful episode. Appreciate your expertise and your time. Thanks for joining the Crib Ciders family. Thanks for having me. This was great. So, this has been another episode of the Crib Ciders. Thanks for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high-value practice changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player, or send us an email at thecribsetters at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Dr. Sam Mazur, and our showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazur, and our executive producer for this show, Dr. Sam Mazur. We'd also like to thank our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I've been Justin Lee Burke. I've been Sam Mazur. And this has been Chris the Chew Man Chew. Thank you, and good night. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.